Our reading this morning is from the book of Romans, chapter 10, and you'll find it on page 1137 in the Church Bibles. So it's Romans chapter 10, and we're going to be reading from verse 9 down to verse 15. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 to 15. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As Scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everybody. Um, Stuart, I would love you to read that, like do an audio book. I just, I could hear that. That's wonderful. You could read the Bible for me in the morning. That would be wonderful. You've got such a nice voice. I'm serious, you should, yeah, okay. Um, good morning, everybody. It's lovely to, to see you all. Um, I'm Ollie, and um, I'm one of the associate vicars here, and I, I want to just extend my um, Happy New Year to you. Um, well, do keep this passage open, and we're going to look through that, and we're looking at the subject, sharing the truth that saves today. Sharing the truth that saves. Um, I once uh, received an, uh, an email and when I was here at HT, and it said this, it said, Hi, I like your website, and I live in the area. I was just wondering, what is the gospel, and how does a person get right with God? That was it. I was like, I don't, yeah, that's, a, that's quite an email to get. I don't know what, what an amazing, you know, that's an amazing opportunity. It's like an open goal. This is the chance. However, sometimes the simplest questions, you know, they're like the hardest ones to answer. And it, it took me pretty much a, a, lot of a, lot of, a lot of the day to write that email. Um, where do you start? Uh, what do you include? Uh, what, would, what would you say? Um, just before uh, my wife and I had our third child, so it's that's six years ago now, I discovered the sad realization that cars, most cars, can't fit a third child seat at the back. Uh, I thought there were three seats, three children, there's two adults at the front, three at the back, this is work. And the amount of time I spent hours with a new car seat trying to work out how to fit them all in. And what, they, eventually they did weirdly fit in, but it was always that one child would be at like a, a slight 30 degree angle. <laughs> and I was like, does it, honey, does this work? Is this appropriate? And she was like, no. Uh, so um, we, we um, had swallowed pride and actually went to go and buy a car. And I remember visiting you know, some secondhand uh, car dealers and there was a few salesmen, they were doing their thing, but no one was coming up you know, doing the hard sell. So I thought I'd go in and speak to someone. And then, um, uh, so I asked this guy, I, said, I went up to him, I said, hey, what make is like the most reliable car? This is a really low point in my life, okay, to ask this question. But what make is like the most reliable that I'm going to get the most bang for my buck? It's not going to run out, okay? And he says, well, you know, they're, they're, they're all pretty good these days. 
So, you know, wanting him to push him for a little bit more of a narrowing down answer, I said, but what, what car would you buy? I thought, this is help. And he went, yeah, I don't, I don't really buy cars. <laughs> so I didn't feel it was the most reassuring answer, so I, you know, I just promptly left. He was truly awful at, at selling cars. And if you're going to sell cars, you think you'd just be interested in them. Now, we don't need to become great evangelists, but we do all need to be able to speak with enthusiasm you know, why we believe Jesus is our Lord and Savior. What difference does that make in my life today? And how can others know this person, Jesus? We've got to be able to communicate those with, with some enthusiasm. And it might not be from a platform like here, but there are always opportunities to share. And when those moments come, what would you say? Today, I want to look at this question. What does it take to become a child of God? Is it down to, to culture, uh, religion, uh, goodness, achievements? Is it passionate zeal for the Lord? Well, in our passage today, Paul is writing to a church that is full of both Jewish and Gentile believers. And there seems to have risen some tension between them about what does it mean to become, to, what it means to be saved, to be a Christian. Jewish believers had passed on the faith to the Roman Gentiles, but with the Jewish bent, which is keep the law. Keep the law. And what seems particularly to pain Paul is that the Jews are, are zealous for God. It says in uh, verse 1 of chapter 10, it says, But their zeal is not based on knowledge. Their zeal was not based on knowledge. Now, this is something Paul knew firsthand, since he himself was a Jew and he was extremely zealous to please the Lord and honor him and serve him. But Paul is giving credit where credit is due, and he's, gr and he's granting how good it is for Israel to, to uh, be so keenly, you know, to feel so keenly the importance of honoring God. But then Paul says, but zeal, passion is not enough. That zeal must be based on knowledge. This is a complete contradiction of uh, maybe a common uh, proverb of our time. It, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you are sincere. Well, says Paul, the Jews were sincere and zealous in their beliefs, but their beliefs were not based on knowledge. For being zealous for the Lord will not make you a child of God will not make you saved. The truth is that zeal without knowledge or understanding is foolishness, it's aimless. Um, just this week, I went for a, a nice long walk with my eldest daughter and my dog. Uh, I thought it would be a bonding moment. It turned out in a slightly different way. We'll get there. Um, I, I don't know if you've noticed. It has rained quite a bit recently. Anyone notice that? It's been raining like forever. And um, we found ourselves near the river where it particularly had got flooded. And I told Amelie, I'm sure that the water will not go over the top of our wellies. I'm pretty sure we're fine. And um, so we plodded on. The dog, he's just not looking amused that he was like wading through in shorter legs through kind of flood water. Um, and the light was fading. And so I, I took out my phone to put a bit of a torch to be able to show us the way. And I thought this is the moment we should take a photo. So I've got a little photo. This is, this is our moment. This was quite nice, a nice moment. Do you want to chuck that up on the screen? Um, it'll come. And so uh, here we go. So my daughter's on the left. You can see it's getting close. And the dog, he doesn't have green eyes, the dog, normally, but, you know, just go with it. Um, he was not happy. So this is, this is a good moment. Now, 
we got to a point where we, we'd, we'd waded for quite a while through the high water, and then and it was getting a little higher. It was really on the rim, but I could see the road. I could see where it, the, it, all the water had gone. And um, I thought, we can do this. And at that point, the dog decided, I'm having enough, not enough for this. And he just, I had him on a lead at that point. He just leaped into some um, high ground and just stood there and refused to move. And then at that, also at the same point, my daughter, the, the water started going over her, her wellies and she just completely filled up. And her face, like, I'm sinking. And then at that point, I was trying to rescue her, which is good because I rescued her before the dog. I went to rescue her. And as I was rescuing her, I got water, you know, water in my wellies. And at that point, my phone fell into the water. <laughs> So I dropped her to try and get the water because that is really expensive. And then I, then I picked her up again and uh, we rescued her. And then, then I said to her, go, save yourself. Save yourself. And then I, I had to wade in. This is my normal walking route, but the water was here. I promise you not, it was wading in to get a, a terrified 36 kilo Labrador who wouldn't move. I had to carry him wading through the water, throw him over a fence, where we, and we just, look, we just looked at each other, and Emily and I, and a very confused dog, we had to waddle home a mile for Lois to just look at us and just think, you fools, you should have just turned around. Now, this is zeal with absolutely no knowledge of what we were walking into. And so, if salvation, and we come back to our point, doesn't come from our own zeal, our own passion to please God, then how does it come? If it's not about just, you know, being, putting all our effort how does it come? Well, according to Paul, it boils down to this. Verse 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your hearts that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's it. Simple and as wonderful and as glorious as that. My first point is this. Saving faith comes from believing in the Lordship of Jesus and his resurrection from the dead. Believing in the lordship of Jesus and the resurrection of the dead. For Paul and Jesus, there were just kind of two categories which divided humanity. They were kind of black and white with this issue. He says those saved and those not saved. The lost and the found. Those, the kind of the wheat and the weeds. Those on the narrow path or those on the, the broad path that leads to destruction. Those in Christ and those outside of Christ. That's how scripture presents it. Following um, the sinking of the, the Titanic in the North Atlantic Ocean in 1912, the ship's owners, the, the White Star, uh, in, um, uh, in Liverpool, placed two notice boards outside their offices. And uh, they were marked, known to be saved and known to be lost. As the fate of the passengers were made known, their names were added to one or the other board. Now, the same is true eternally for all the world who are ultimately drowning in sin. Either their name is in the book of life, those known to be saved, or it is not those known to be dead. And for the church, our mission is to seek to empty the list and, pl uh, uh, and place their names on the list of those known to be found. But this way of thinking about salvation is not always popular. Maybe even here, with us here, maybe some of you are thinking, I just don't know if I agree with that. And actually, a lot of people find this really difficult. Now, I read of a religious survey in America, though I'm sure it would be very similar findings here, that stated 70% of Americans with a religious affiliation say that many religions, and not just their own, can lead to eternal life. 
It also indicated that 57% of those who are attending evangelical churches, so like ours, also agreed that mo- many religions can lead to eternal life. Only 36% chose the alternative. My religion, my faith is the one true faith leading to eternal life. And so it boils down to our basis of our belief. If we hold true to the Bible, we cannot avoid the, the, the nature of the extraordinary inclusivity of uh, the gospel. You know, all are welcome, but also the exclusivity of the Christian faith. Verse 9 tells us, saving faith firstly comes through a truth that must be known. You know, saving faith is not a blind leap in the dark like my walk in the river. It, for there must be some basic knowledge given to us that we, that we all agree with. And that is, firstly, that Jesus is Lord. The term Jesus is Lord is a reference to his divinity. And the Greek word Paul uses for Lord is kurios, which in the Greek um, Old um, in the Greek Old Testament, the word "curious" was a translation for God's personal name of Yahweh. And so to call Jesus curious was not only to claim that he was God, but also to claim that he was the supreme authority over the world. There was and is no other God than him. And the second thing, we believe that firstly he is Jesus' Lord. Second thing is we must believe that he was raised from the dead and that he died. In other words, you must believe in Christ's life, death, and resurrection for our sins. There must be this basic understanding of the gospel for someone to, to believe. Tim Keller, the late pastor, said this, You cannot be saved by believing in believing. I came uh, to faith uh, aged nine. Uh, I, I struggled to, to read. I actually write when I was uh, nine or ten. It took me a long time to do that. I'm dyslexic, so it just took me a little while to, to get there. And um, I, So I hadn't really read the Bible. Um, I'd heard stories. I'd remembered people telling me the gospel in a very simple way. I remember that, you know, being told that God loved me so much that he sent his one and only son that if I believe in him, I will not perish, but have eternal life. I remember that. And for me, that was all I needed to know to be able to start making a commitment to following Jesus. But I needed to know something. I needed to know that before I took that initial step of faith. It wasn't a blind leap. And so secondly, saving faith comes from a truth that must be believed um, I often find, we've, as we've recently done our um, last Alpha course, I often find that during the course, there are a number of guests that come to a point where someone has heard the gospel and they start thinking it's true, but, but it still needs a step of faith to start believing, uh, you know, to putting their trust in Jesus. It's, a tr- it's a, almost like a transformation from it being a head moment to a heart moment. And it's so important. It's a key moment for someone knowing the truth in their head and believing this truth, which they're going to live out in their everyday life. And that is the faith that saves. Not just a general belief that Christ lived or in his teachings. You know, we, but we must totally put our trust in Jesus being Lord and in his death and in his resurrection for us. It's almost taking the crown off our own head, of us being the own king or queen of our own life and saying, actually, Lord, you are in charge. You are on the throne. And Paul promises that whenever we, when we do that, we put our trust completely in him, that we will never regret it in verse 11. So, saving faith comes from believing Jesus is Lord and in his resurrection from the dead. That is wonderful news. That is good news. Second thing, saving faith is for anyone and everyone. Um, There's a club in London. I've got a picture. It's called White's Club. 
in London and is considered by many to be the most exclusive private club in London. And it was founded in 1693 and has a long waiting list and new members need to be vouched by by 35 signatories to get in. Oh, yes. Its members include King Charles and uh, Prince of Wales and maybe a few splattering of you folk out there. As we know, Paul is writing to a church full of Jews and Gentiles, and he is bending over backwards to tell them, anyone and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, I can pretty much guarantee that I will never be a member of White's Club. You know, I wouldn't get through the door. They wouldn't let me in. But the good news of the gospel is there is an open offer to anyone who everyone who puts their faith and trust in Jesus. You can take that down. There is not a standard you need to reach or or a people group, a number of people to get signatories for you to be welcomed by Jesus. And when we put our trust in Jesus, it says in verse 11 that our shame is removed as God pours out his blessings on our lives. I was recently chatting to someone who'd, who'd come to faith and telling me of how uh, he can see a significant change in his life. That there's been a real sense of peace and joy that has come from saying yes to following Jesus. And I can just see in him the shame of being, is being replaced by the, the blessing of God. The many, many blessings of God poured out in him. And so if you are here today and you don't think you, you have a faith or you don't think that you, are, you deserve to be saved or you don't think you are good enough, this passage shows us that for those who aren't sure that they qualify, that this offer of faith is, as it says in verse 13, everyone, Jew, Gentile, religious, irrigid, irreligious, good, bad, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, who recognizes who Jesus is and are in our need for him. will be saved, utterly loved, blessed and justified eternally by God. All are welcome. Saving faith is for anyone and everyone. And thirdly and finally, we are sent to proclaim this saving faith. We are sent to proclaim saving faith. Now in our passage, Paul's logic on reaching people with the gospel goes as follows, as it goes in verse 14. Why don't people call to be saved? Because they don't believe. Paul expects people to believe, many people to believe when they hear the, the good news. It just happens. It does happen. Why don't they believe? Because they've not heard. Paul says often it's ignorance rather uh, than hostility is a factor of not believing, which I think is so true today. How will they hear? Well, someone needs to tell them. There needs to be some verbal explanation. It can't just be uh, maybe, you know, We'll just wait for them to have a dream. Yes, that happens, but we need, to, we need to tell them. There need to be something to be said. And who is sent to tell them? Well, following in the footsteps of this great commission given to the apostles, we are. Have you ever uh, tried to uh, call a telephone helpline uh, to find it so infuriatingly confusing that you just end up giving up and thinking they, they wouldn't be able to help you anyway. Yeah? We've all been there. Yeah? Well, Paul is saying people do not call on the Lord because they don't believe Jesus can make any difference in their lives. They don't bother. They're going to just give up. They don't believe Jesus, has, Jesus offers life. They don't believe Jesus holds eternity in his hands. They don't, maybe... uh, Many generally believe that maybe getting a ham sandwich or a bubble iced tea is more useful to them than Jesus. How do we counter this view? 
Well, we need to tell them, we need to proclaim this real Jesus. And if we, the church, limit the gospel message to to vague platitudes of loving each other and doing good works, and we don't take his teaching seriously, why would anyone seriously consider giving their lives over to him and trusting him with their lives? I wouldn't. If, however, we proclaim that out of love for us, God, in the person of his Son, stepped into creation. If we proclaim that Jesus proved beyond doubt in his words and his miracles that he is God. If we proclaim that on the cross that he paid for the penalty for our sin against God that separated us from him. If we proclaim in his resurrection and in his ascension that he defeated death and lives forever. If we proclaim that he sent us the gift of the Holy Spirit that transforms lives, including our own. If we proclaim that he will return, and in his return, he will bring justice to the living and the dead. And if we proclaim on the day of his second coming, those who trusted in him will begin their internal reign with him. If we proclaim the real Jesus, then we will get a real and genuine reaction. And for many people, it will be a revelation to them. I didn't know. No one has told me. And it will sound crazy and impossible if it just ends there. Uh, If we start proclaiming Jesus, what will they start wanting to see? They want to see proof. They will look at you and say, actually, does Jesus really change lives? I'm going to look at your life. Does your talk you know, go in line with your walk? It is then that people will start believing. That car salesman that I met didn't believe in the product he was selling. So as a result, I didn't trust in his advice. And those who are the best witnesses of Jesus are those who have been transformed by knowing him. They radiate. They look different. They, they take on the, the characteristics of Jesus. You probably have someone in mind right now that just is that to you. Wow, they just look like Jesus to me. They have beautiful feet, as we see in our passage. Well, so could today be the day that you declare for the first time, Jesus is Lord. Could today be the day you believe God raised him from the dead? If so, please do not leave here without talking to someone, myself or one of the team. We would love to chat to you with you and pray with you. For those of you who, who know and love Jesus already, and I know many of us here will be there, do you have beautiful feet? I know my wife had beautiful feet. She goes to the pedicure quite often, and it's a very nice feet. But some of you, others, can have ingrown toenails, bunions, corns, but you, you'll still have beautiful feet. Verse 15, for how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And I just want to finish very, very briefly just by saying just some practical ways of how we can be people with beautiful feet. Um, I've got seven practical steps, very quick, that I found helpful in sharing my faith. They're just ones that came to me. Firstly, is pray for opportunities to share your faith. According to a report made by um, an organization called Talking Jesus, which represents people like, has organizations like Alpha in in it, um, 33% of people want to know more about Jesus. That's one in three people are open to finding out more about the gospel. Isn't that exciting? What an opportunity. Secondly, be yourself. Being authentic and genuine is is so important. Um, Think about the gifts the Lord has given you and gifted you with and use them. Don't try and copy someone else, uh, but actually think, how has the Lord made me? If I'm a great talker, if I'm a great listener, if I'm really creative, whatever it is, use the gifts the Lord has given you. Thirdly, know your story. 
know your story, sharing how God impacts your life both today, but also how it's in the past as well, uh, is so powerful. Our, our stories are unique and they allow people to see what faith looks like in practice. So if you don't know, if someone says, why are you Christian right now? And you're like, oh, freeze up. Go away, write it down, know your story. Fourthly, point people to Jesus. It sounds obvious one, but I have often found myself pointing people to church. That's great. Church is great, but um, I've often made the mistake that I just speak about church and not about the person that I worship in church. People don't come to faith because we worship in a church with good bands and have lots of people in it. You know, that's a wonderful, wonderful outworking of it. People come to faith because someone has taken the time to tell them about Jesus. So point people to Jesus, not just the church. Fifthly, ask questions. You know, if it was good enough for Jesus always to ask a question, then it should be good enough for us. And uh, now asking questions allows people to open up about what they believe. And I found that when I do this, people often, because then, you know, Curtis will ask what I believe. So it's a great opportunity for us to share faith by asking questions. Sixthly, penultimate one, look out for opportunities to lead people for the Lord. I often feel sometimes we can miss opportunities to lead people to the Lord because um, we, they didn't come up to us and say, Ollie, how do I become a Christian right now? Very rarely does that happen. But so often we meet people through conversation and realizing this person is really open to Christianity and wants to believe, but maybe they still have some more questions. Well, they will always have more questions. That's just part of faith. But it's sometimes good to encourage them to follow Jesus now and trust that he will give some of the answers as you, as you walk out in faith. Um, one of the great theologians and philosophers of the 11th century, Anselm of Canterbury, said this. He says, Credo ut intelligem. If you don't know what that is. Um, it means, I believe in order that I might understand. He said, I do not seek to understand in order to believe, but I believe in order to understand. So sometimes people need a bit of encouragement to take a step. And then actually through you know, experiencing the gift of the Holy Spirit, people will start understanding faith themselves. And seventh, finally, invite people to Alpha on the 18th of January. Come on, people. Um, what is one of the best evangelistic methods that we have is to say, come and see. Uh, come and see. What an easy thing. And uh, my, my whole family, including myself, all came to faith through one person saying, come and see. And it transformed our lives. And Alpha is a great blessing for the church to share faith with others. Um, one of our guests uh, here today took five years of come and see invitations. And uh, they came and they came to faith. So that is a wonderful thing. So be perseverance in that. And... Um, just reminding that statistic, one in three people are open to being told about faith. So why not ask three people over the next week or so, and maybe the stats are on your side, and one of them will be saying yes. So I wanted to finish by just uh, um, making us getting, watching the, the, the uh, alpha video that we filmed last term. Um, we've shown it in church already, so you may have seen it. But many of the guests here, each of them, came because someone said, come and see, come and find out more. And um, we're gonna, I'm going to end by us watching the video and then Lila's going to come up. Here we go. My name is Dan. My name is Ines. My name's Charlotte. Uh, my name is Ashley. Yeah, my name is Rakesh. My name is Sarah. And I came on Alpha because I had a friend who invited me to come with her. Uh, I came on Alpha because um, a friend recommended to me. Came because I had a lot of questions and I thought it might be a good place to kind of ask them and get some answers. Um, I guess before coming, I kind of knew the name, but I didn't really know much about like who he was or what he did. It's reminded me very much that I can't earn his love and that um, there's nothing that I can actually do and that he does love me. It's just made me more aware of how how God is in my life in so many ways and walks with me every day. The session about faith was very impactful because 
I had not thought about it in the way that it was presented. It was much more close and more real. I think probably the session on forgiveness. How to resist evil. Thanks to Jesus, I've been able to fight and he's allowed me to see his plan and to see that doing things my way is not the way forward. I guess the most impactful has been kind of hearing about all of the evidence and all of the historical kind of records that we have because I'm quite an evidence-based person so I found that really helpful in kind of understanding and believing in kind of all those stories and stuff. It's been such a welcoming, safe place. In the groups that I was in, we had people from all different backgrounds, all ages, some atheists, some already believers in, in Christ. And that mix actually really lends itself well to a good open discussion. There's no pressure for you to uh, sort of do anything or feel anything. You're just coming to learn and to talk about the big things. All opinions and all points of view, I think, are perceived as valid and I still feel, you know, myself and welcome, even though I don't come from the same place. Um, actually, I've got social anxiety, but I didn't feel any of that at all. And actually, do you know what? I would, I could come on it all over again because I just feel like I can't get enough of it. It's wonderful.